<laughs> so yes, welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Dirk Riele. I've been a professor of computer science, software engineering with a focus on open source for the last eight years. And before that, worked for about 15 years in industry. That structures also how we go about our research. It's uh, strongly related to industry. Yes, please. Can we what? Tweet. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, there's nothing secret um, about my talk. Feel free to take photos or attribute whatever nonsense I may be saying uh, to me. Um, so um, we worked, uh, I worked in industry, and this is also how my research group um, works. Um, we have had and continue to have lots of industry partners. Our main engagement with industry is actually in line with what you might suspect from the earlier talk today, uh, open source software. So we help companies from the most basic, getting compliant uh, with open source licenses, having a governance process, contributing to open source, all the way along the whole maturity model you saw earlier on, um, on how to open source and get the desired benefits. We do this in a very structured way. Industry has defined somewhat common requirements, recruiting, outsourcing, innovation, and so forth. And you can do this in staged, more complex, more elaborate uh, projects with us, starting with small, trust-building uh, student projects. So, as I said, we, uh, open source is uh, a big part of our work, and so now these days is inner source. But I want to start with uh, open source. Uh, most companies, in particular if you take a company perspective, first run into the legal aspects. Open source is software that comes to you by way of these weird licenses. And it's often forgotten that there's a second definition of open source software that you can find on the Open Source Initiative website stating that open source is actually a development process, a better development process than many, giving you lots of benefits, higher quality of the source code, higher reliability, etc. It's understood very well by the open source world that it's a collaboration process. And as you've heard uh, today already, that is what we're trying to do with inner source. Take the best practices, not the legal stuff, take the best practices of open source, adjust it and apply it within the corporate environment. That is the basic idea. Um, so I assume many of you are experts, but just quickly, on the most basic level, the very first step, uh, what it means is to lay open your project artifacts, your source, source code within the company and not hide it inside a silo. If someone comes along, if someone wants to use it or even wants to help you, welcome them rather than reject them. And that may already sound to a traditional company person kind of weird, but we'll get into that. Why would you do all of that? By now we have enough uh, experience reports that tell us the benefits of doing inner source consist consistently, reliably across many experience reports. At the most basic level, it's the holy grail of software development or productivity, faster, better, cheaper software development. Specifically then, to make some early arguments, it is uh, higher quality of your code components. Why? If you lay them open, if you share them, rather than redundantly develop the same component in six different silos, if you share them, if you get more users, you mature the component faster. The quality gets higher, faster, and people find bugs faster, etc. So ultimately, inner source, by removing redundancy and increasing collaboration, improves code quality. Also, as people collaborate across silo boundaries, uh, they um, share knowledge faster, best practices travel faster from one silo to another. So it's not that one person knows something and the other takes years to learn how to do it right, no, it travels much faster. And at present, where inner source, despite almost 20 years of age, is still a new thing. People report, uh, developers report higher job satisfaction because it makes their work more, worth, more worthwhile. So many of you in the audience may actually be on the slide because many companies have reported we are doing inner source. It's still diverse, but there are plenty of companies now who have been at it uh, for a while. So I like, I would like to emphasize uh, 
how difficult it actually is by showing how different open source is from what you have in traditional companies, why that is a challenge, and then, of course, how to address it. So when we look at open source, so it's easily said, yeah, let's just use open source practice. It's 11 times I learned, 11 times uh, uh, Linux is more efficient than Bosch. So uh, th that's not tweetable, but, um, but that wasn't me. Um, uh, that's just amazing, but it's so different if you grew up in a classic company. Classic companies are hierarchically structured. People are clearly allocated to projects, while in open source, we assume that you can find the project that's right for you. You self-allocate. And not only, and that's possible because projects are visible, available, actually open source projects market themselves. And our source needs to learn that as well. So uh, projects are available and they welcome people. Decision-making in in within companies, if everything fails, someone is the boss. The hammer, hammer comes down and this is how decisions ultimately get enforced. If you were to do that in open source with volunteers, people would walk away. They want to be taken serious. So even if you feel like you're suffering badly, you need to discuss things based on the merits. You need to come to a conclusion that's agreeable to everyone along the lines of we really invested the time to understand this and it's not a decision from the top. Um, so it's a shared, there's buy-in in decisions. Finally, in classic companies, not so much in Agile, but still a lot, you simply get assigned to your job. Uh, it's an assigned task, and ideally, in the classic sense, you function like a cog. No manager wants to be too dependent on any one particular person, so ideally you're replaceable. Open source does exactly the opposite. There is no single defined way of how to do open source. Rather, projects choose their own process and adjust the process to the specific abilities, to some extent, of the people in the project. Of course, best practices travel and you don't randomly change things, but if you're a volunteer in an open source project, people are willing, if you're reasonable, are willing to listening to you as you might change the process and you don't have to go through a big process definition department to rearrange your workflows. Communication, oh my God. Um, in open source, all, if it's not been put down in an email, um, it has not been said. So in open source, communication needs to be public. Everyone can see it. It's got to be written, so it's asynchronous. People can catch up later if they're in the wrong time zone. You cannot omit important parts. It's got to be complete. And of course, above all, it gets archived using some mailing list software. Imagine a highly political organization where people try to figure out things behind closed doors. They will not publicly, in written form, completely have their discussions archived so that someone later could hold their feet to the fire. So, depending on your organization, it's very different how open source goes about work. Finally, quality assurance in open source. Um, still, people who think open source is cowboy coding, of course it's not. Um, but it has its own quality assurance mechanism. The key, there are many, but the key one is peer review. Uh, and it's actually a two-class society. So you have an inner team, a core team of committers who review any possible code contribution for the needed quality before they ever put it into the code base. So it's a two-step process if you're not part of the core team. You do your work, you make a contribution perhaps, but it gets reviewed, peer reviewed, before it might enter the code base. So that uh, makes a uh, two-class society. Uh, inside a company, you're basically, if you are made an employee, you're trusted, you're put on the project, and you can typically right away commit to the code repository. It's only been recent that we've seen pre-commit code review enter uh, the uh, regular development streams of uh, people. That's not, not, not 20 years ago. So, uh, and that's what you're supposed to do inside a company. Uh, how could that possibly work? So here are actually specific scenarios uh, that you can talk to your peers about that we've seen work where people instantly recognize, oh yeah, that's where we should be collaborating in a way, where we lay our artifacts open, uh, and where we get benefits of that, and where we should be acting in an open source style way. Uh, the first is the uh, simple bug fix. So assume a situation not too uncommon where there's a shared library, shared component, part of a platform that is reused or is simply used by multiple products. 
So if there's a bug in the shared library, in the shared component, uh, in the classic organization, you will now file a bug report and then you'll wait for half a year. If it's urgent, you escalate it, creating trouble for everyone. Half a year later, or maybe five months later, now you get the bug fix. All right, so what did you do in the meantime? You wrote more bad code because your component X or Y shielded itself from the bug in the underlying library. So you've got a bug that really should be fixed. Now you wrote shielding code in the dependent components, so you wrote more code rather than addressing the problem. In an inner source world, where you have access to the library component right away, you fix the bug first for yourself, and then you submit your bug fix back to the library component. You don't have to wait for half a year, and you don't have to write additional bad code just to shield yourself against, uh, against the bug. The second scenario that's very common in companies is uh, large-scale refactorings. So this time the other way. Uh, in the bug fix example, the dependent components contributed to the underlying component. Now we're turning it around. The component, uh, the library component, needs to change its API. So there's an incremental change to the I API. That's pretty horrible. So in classic companies, you create a new API. You version it. You uh, deprecate the old methods. You tell your clients, please change your API and please do it by uh, in six months. And they probably still haven't done it in six months, so you start adding sleep method calls to your old API. It's just a nuisance. In the new world of inner source, um, if you have access to your client code, to the dependent components, you will actually realize the API change to the extent that you can. Um, not all of them, but many you can. And then submit back the change dependent code to these dependent components in one go. Companies who have a good grasp of their code base can do that. And this way you don't have this lengthy process of API evolution uh, where you don't need it, but can make uh, the changes and act them rather quickly. But the real interest in inner source comes uh, through the third, third scenario, uh, a new component. So what if the component Z didn't even exist yet, but rather product A and product B because they do inner source or because they've been accustomed to breaking down their silo boundaries, collaborate with each other uh, and realize we have this need for a shared component. And that's, of course, the purest form of inner source where multiple independent organizational units spend time and effort to jointly develop and thereby are more cost effective what they both need. So what I'll do now is to work through our research history, our cases, case studies, if you will, uh, of having worked with companies. I'll start out, actually, even before I became a professor, my last job before academia um, was, with, was with SAP Research uh, in the Silicon Valley, where I was leading the open source research group from 2000 six to 2009. So my main focus was how can SAP benefit from open source strategically and all of that. In addition, we also realized, well, there's this inner source thing. Wouldn't SAP want to do uh, inner source? Uh, but I was in the research organization. So um, what we did was, as many might start out uh, doing uh, inner source, we started with tools. So we specifically set up a tool called uh, SAP Forge, which is a Forge, was a Forge, and based on the now really, really stale GForge code base. And uh, we grew that in the three years that I was there uh, from zero to 1,500 developers. At that time, SAP had about 15,000 developers in total, so we got a good chunk of uh, the people. Um, here you can see it, it's just a software forge. I want to point out that software forges are an invention of the open source world. It's one of the two main tool innovations that open source has given us, uh, distributed version control being the other one. Um, as you know, it's a, a software forge is a place where people um, uh, get all the tools they need for a particular project. But then it is also the place where all the projects can possibly be found. And to find projects, this is critical now, you need to make that easy. So uh, all forges, are, implementers of forges are aware of that. You need to provide a search box. 
have all the projects on that index so they can be found. You uh, show who's active, who needs more help. Um, this is cleanest on originally SourceForge, these days perhaps GitHub, uh, where you have, again, the search box, uh, you have a hierarchical exploration, where do I find projects I might find interesting, and just lucky chance uh, what's hot right now. So that is the key property, how a soft, one of the key properties of how a software forge supports inner source, simply by making all projects findable in one place. They are indexed, they are available at that one place, they can be found, etc. Oh, and ideally, they're also available forever. So uh, when I still worked at SAP, I don't know how many projects there were that were stopped, shut down. There was not an integrated tool infrastructure. So off it went on a tape and never to be seen again. So software on a tape isn't really searchable. So um, we had driven that initiative out of uh, SAP research. Uh, were somewhat successful. I wouldn't say super successful, uh, but the tool certainly worked. In many cases, I believe that people actually just wanted better tooling, not perforce subversion it was at the time that uh, SAP Forge provided. The Forge is a very good way in this context, um, with our strong, since I worked in research, uh, as a good way to transfer research into product units. It's a common problem. Uh, researchers want to do their research and productization is kind of, it's not an afterthought, but it's a, still a challenge for many companies to uh, not have too strong a boundary between a research and a product development organization. And inner source here plays out in that the product units could see early on what research is doing. Research wasn't hiding its stuff any longer in its own research silo, but was showing and was willing and open to discuss it, their work with product units. So all the successful examples we have on, had on SAP Forge were research projects where the product units were interested enough to come along and talk about it and make sure that nothing got in the way for later productization, as opposed to a hard hit, now please take our work from the research to the product unit. All right, so I've been telling this story that I think software forges are super important, but they are tools. And as we also heard earlier, um, culture is probably even more important. So I'm switching gears now. Um, this was my last job in industry. I moved into academia, and I thought inner source would be a good research topic. About eight years ago, it wasn't easy to get corporate research departments to engage and collaborate with us on inner source. It wasn't high enough on the agenda. We did learn, however, that inner source was already on the agenda of uh, product line organizations. So I will now discuss three cases, um, not inner source in general for the company, but specific product lines who came to us and worked with us because they believed that inner source would be helping them. So uh, a product line, uh, I don't know how familiar you are, is the idea that there's basically one product in many different variants, the small, the medium size, and the large device catering to different markets, etc. Um, it's more or less the same product, just different sizes or somehow different. Um, and so there's a product unit for each of the variants, but the source in there, source code in there, the code in there is probably 80% the same. So that's why you have a platform uh, uh, organization in product line engineering, which develops reusable assets, libraries, that the product units are then using, customizing, adjusting to their particular need and market. So you have an organization with these small silos, product units on top of a platform. And this was the common scenario. The companies who came to us were all leading in the segment. That's why they could afford to work with a the university. They were not with their back against the wall. They had time to think about how to improve. And they had read our work and uh, tried inner source and it didn't quite work. So um, these cases, uh, three very different companies uh, I'm presenting here. Uh, that's how you choose them to get a variety. Uh, one, so all large internationally operating companies, one providing business software, one providing healthcare software, and one a telecommunications uh, carrier software uh, company. Um, there's one thing that made our life easier. 
uh, all the product lines were developed in one location, more or less. So we didn't have problems interfering, problems of globally distributed software development. So all pretty much co-located. Um, so we did the usual case study research, talked to a lot of people, gathered materials, etc. And um, what we learned was uh, that they had a shared problem, which is why they came to us. They realized this textbook, product line engineering, and they were still having problems. I mean, remember, these companies were at the state of the art. And their problem, uh, when we analyzed it, uh, had one root cause, which is the separation of uh, the product units catering to their individual market segments uh, the, as profit centers from the underlying platform organization, which is a cost center. And it had the following consequences. Uh, at the highest level, delayed deliveries, increased defect rate, and redundant software components. How so? Well, so how did the delayed deliveries uh, come about? It's very simple, uh, once you think about it, and that's what these companies had realized. Um, uh, if you are delivering a product to a market, you're directly connected to your revenue. You're making money. That's great. Now you need a new person. That's a very direct correlation between revenue you make and request for a new person. The plat that's a product unit. A platform organization asking for more money uh, or for more people has to argue, look, we are going to develop more reusable libraries so that all of our products will somehow be faster. There's one additional step to revenue from a market. It's harder for a platform organization to argue to get more resources, to get more people, than it is for a product unit, because a product unit is so much more directly connected uh, to revenue. As a consequence, the platform organizations in all these three cases and many more we have seen were understaffed. They all complained we do not have enough people to develop these classic reusable assets. And uh, the product org unit said, well, we get the people we want because we make money. As a consequence, as these product units relied on deliveries from the platform, which was understaffed, led to the delays. Now, if you know product line engineering, there are supposed to be certain processes going on. For example, domain engineering. What that means is determining the requirements for the platform. It's a process between the product units and the platform where you sit down together, determine the requirement for the next set of reusable components. All right the components were not as good as they were supposed to be. They were missing the actual requirements. How come? So, I mean, in quotation marks, again, these companies were very good, but uh, not as good as they thought they could be, and they realized, why do we have these bugs? Why did, they, why did the platform misunderstand the requirements? And the answer, again, is very clear. Well, if you sit down, write something on paper, and then s separate again, uh, how can you really make sure that the knowledge from uh, the user, the product unit, walked into the head of the platform organization which is supposed to develop these reusable components. And making a component reusable is even more harder, is even harder than uh, a spe specialized version for a product unit. So as a consequence, this additional gap that the hard separation uh, of uh, product units from uh, platform meant led to a loss in the knowledge of the requirements. Inner source, they thought, would help because if the people from the product units would walk in the door. A, help in development, meaning maybe get stuff to market faster, but also walk in with the requirements in their head, know what they want and can contribute and can refine it over time as part of joint collaborative software development that is uh, in our source. And naturally then uh, you're doing less uh, redundant development. So these companies uh, we worked with uh, had realized some of these problems. We reconfirmed them with our case study research, and they thought inner source might be the solution. So inner source and product line engineering are meant for them. Um, it's a natural approach here that there now is a layer uh, of shared reusable assets that's jointly developed, meaning the inner source asset one here is being developed jointly by a couple of by people from different product units and uh, some from the platform organization. Well, just people working across uh, silo boundaries. So that would mean inner source here. Uh, it didn't mean that everything for them, didn't mean that everything was open. They assumed, and that seems reasonable to me, 
that inner source is probably more likely applicable to new de components that will uh, be changing rapidly, are being developed rapidly, while the platform still worries about longer term stable uh, components and this is how they maintain their existing organizational structure. Now, I came and complained, it doesn't work. So what was wrong uh, with their attempts? Um, we heard uh, already one question to that respect. Uh, one of the problems were middle managers who didn't like the thought of inner source. Um, if you're a middle manager in a product unit, you're given your resources and your set performance goals. You want to fulfill your performance goals or you won't get your bonus. So you're really, really reluctant to see at first naive glance, see your people walk out the door and as you might think instinctively, work on somebody else's project. No way, these are my guys, they're supposed to work for me, help me achieve my performance goals. Um, that is not a valid argument, I imagine, how most people in this room will, will uh, argue or understand, as uh, you would let your developers only contribute and work on components, even if they are developed, say, somewhere else, if these components are relevant for you. You don't randomly contribute to stuff, you contribute and work on stuff that's important to you. In particular, to address the problems mentioned earlier, meaning you get your requirements in there the right way, as opposed to hearing about them half a year later that it doesn't work as you wanted it to be. Nevertheless, that is one of the common problems that uh, middle managers fear a loss of control, fear not achieving their performance goals. Second category of problems was, was uh, with software developers, actually. So you might think all software developers are gung-ho, love uh, inner source. That's not quite true, at least not in our experience. Uh, many like it. Certainly if they've had open source experience, they like it that their work is now more visible to the whole company. But there were also clearly a defined contingent of software developers who exactly hated that. They did not like it that their work was not confined to the team and only be seen by people they directly worked with. The idea that everyone in the company could see their code could even see bugs filed against their code or bugs associated to, uh, assigned to them. Uh, some developers really hate that thought. And um, so as a, it's almost binary in our experience. You've got these people who don't mind, um, uh, don't mind or even love it, and some who really worry about, uh, about the exposure and don't like it. And doesn't actually, as a side remark, doesn't seem to be strongly correlated with the actual abilities. I've seen very good developers who still didn't like uh, the publicity across the company. But again, many liked it that they could build a basically company internal portfolio of work and broaden their scope and, uh, and impact. All right, so these were the problems. Uh, naturally, since they, these companies also, and I'll come to that in a few more slides, uh, wanted us to help them. Uh, we worked with them on, uh, on the various levels, how to set up tooling. As I said, it's not the most important thing, but it is important, and a software forge can do you really good. Um, all the way to uh, how to have your inner source project and how to have an inner source program that uh, enables uh, uh, different inner source projects. Basically, um, we took uh, back then, took a page from the uh, uh, Open Source Foundations, recommended at a minimum they should have an internal coaching organization, mentoring organization like the Apache or Eclipse uh, Foundation, so that uh, uh, they would help each other and could grow that body of, uh, of capable people. Uh, I think it's though, however, over time will be much more diverse than a, sing a single measure. So um, one of the cases uh, we were so wondering, so as is the university, it's a paid engagement and eventually we'll have to drop off. Uh, one of the companies we re-established uh, contact with and are working with again, um, let us look at how our help for their inner source program uh, had developed. And uh, what we can do these days is actually measure how labor flows uh, to see whether it crosses silo boundaries to get a data-based 
and uh, on how relevant inner sources and it's only it's real data but it's here only used as an illustration we can see how at this one company inner source is alive and kicking which made us very happy and uh, these are all workflows labor flows commits uh, crossing uh, organizational unit boundaries at various uh, levels so it can work now there was a second stage of uh, cases we worked with uh, companies where inner source was customized and relevant for particular product lines. Now, if you will, the uh, big win or hope, and I think that's what we've been talking about this morning, is an even broader approach where inner source is a program across the whole company where shared reusable assets are available really to everyone, not somehow constrained to a product line, uh, something where these assets are uh, accessible to everyone, but where there is no pre-existing platform organization. As you go into companies, establish your inner source programs, if you try to do it in the context of a product line, where there is an organization that believes it's responsible for shared reusable libraries, the platform organization, that's the job. You'll have to work with that because they might simply say, well, what's this inner source stuff? We are responsible for reusable assets. What are you trying to do? This problem you do not have if you work, say, across silo boundaries on the level of business units uh, where there is no shared supporting platform organization. So you can have inner source assets that would be the goal where the business units uh, contribute, collaboratively develop these shared reusable assets uh, for their own and the joint uh, benefit. So this is the current set of companies uh, that uh, we are working with. And uh, I would like to uh, touch on the different aspects of what we are doing here. One thing is our mode of engagement with industry, um, it's still evolving, but it's supposed to be handbook based. So we come in with a handbook of best practices that we learn from successful companies in the space and apply it, basically turning our collaboration with industry into case study uh, research. So one of my uh, uh, people um, is our inner source experts is working on a handbook of best practices. That would be Michi. Maybe you can wave. This is uh, Michael Dorner. He is here. He will actually even give a talk about some, a of, of some aspects of his work. Please talk to him if you are interested in the inner source best practices uh, that we are working on. Um, this is qualitative, how to have good governance, what processes, processes and practices you need. Um, we already heard it today, for example, um, a requirement uh, to manage in a source that, say, every developer inside a company should spend 10% of the time on an inner source project. That would be some managerial performance goal you could set everyone in the hope of fostering inner source. As a side remark, what wasn't said, but this is actually super important and should make us all hopeful for inner source is such a requirement, such a performance goal has to come, top, come, come down from the top. And these are actually our friends, the business owner of a product line or of a whole development organization. They instinctively understand that there's too much redundancy going on. They will be very much in favor if only we knew how to do it how to remove that redundancy, collaborate better, mature components faster, and inner source is the obvious solution. The big boss will be in support of that, so you can get performance goals like that established. It's the people in the middle who are maybe suffering or maybe resistant to the cultural change of, of how to collaborate. So, but in order for, uh, for having a managerial type of uh, incentives, if you want them, you also heard there are obviously limits to this classic hardcore management, but still it might be helpful. We are also performing data-driven research. So here's a view on an aspect of our dashboard of inner source collaboration. Uh, we call it management accounting because we basically account for labor flows inside the company. So that, for example, at the end we can say, yes, this person fulfilled a performance goal of 10% uh, of that time went into inner source. That is the work uh, primarily of um, 
Maximilian Caparo, Max, can you wave? So, uh, <laughs> uh, Max will also be presenting about our work. So, the goal here is to go from the qualitative, super important, cultural but subtle changes to can we measure it, can we manage it? Of course, always asking how much formalism do we want, but certainly it makes things easier for top-level management if they can get reasonable data and performances. So the third topic we are working on, and perhaps the hardest, is uh, transfer pricing. So who of you believes transfer pricing is a problem for inner source? Okay, so uh, perhaps I should have asked <laughs> Double the hand, yes. So transfer pricing is the problem that you need to attach a price, uh, some financial flow, uh, if intellectual property crosses a legal boundary, whether it's a tax boundary, someone in India commits something to a code repository in Germany, or whether it's intellectual property flow, uh, again, commits code uh, between two legal entities of the same company. So it could just be Germany and there's a holding structure and two different business units who are their own legal entity collaborate using inner source. The problem here is you move IP around and the tax man, uh, the tax authorities want you to put prices on that so that you don't shift revenues into places where they are taxed lowest, meaning Ireland these days, I think. Um, so uh, there's a common problem here that's actually getting a fair bit of political attention too. Uh, and inner source will be squarely in the middle of that. Uh, transfer pricing is simply the overall challenge of uh, putting a price as you move IP or anything of uh, or capital across some boundary. Uh, we don't even quite know how to do that well for software in chunky blocks, and we certainly don't know how to do that on a small scale level of individual code contributions in inner source projects. It's uh, a complex problem. Um, uh, we have Sebastian Duda working on that, please wave. So that concludes my three inner source musketeers sitting over there. They are really friendly people, they'd love to talk to you, so if you have questions on any of these, please, please uh, hunt them down. Um, so um, this is perhaps the toughest problem where we are working with another tax professor and other PhD student in the tax and business department of our university. So um, if you like that, we are happy to work with companies, as I said. We've kind of packaged that into classic engagement models. I'll be happy to talk about that. I will actually make the slides available on the web, and I believe it's being recorded. So um, well, the Chatham House rules are waived for this. But now, I guess, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question. Mm -hmm. So I mostly talked about challenges, so things we still need to understand and improve, like how to work with middle managers or developers. So I don't view that as dangerous. These are really challenges. The one, no, no, I mean, uh, the one danger I saw was the transfer pricing thing, because you need to get that right. If you don't get that right and your financial compliance guys are on the ball, you might not be allowed to do inner source. So that's a real problem or danger, if you will. Now, the security. So uh, there's one confusion that applies to open source and possibly also to inner source, which is somehow people are naive, uh, meaning they don't necessarily act in the best interest of the project, but rather act in such a way as following patterns without thinking much. So in open source, for example, um, if you have, if 
the developers of the open source projects come from company who do safety or security critical uh, software, they will certainly bring their best practices into that project. They will not be stupid. They know what it's for and how it will be used. And so looking forward, they will perform the software development using all the best practices there are for developing safety critical uh, software systems because they know they want to use it and that's why the company pays them to contribute. So all of these requirements by way of capable people come into these projects. Now, whether it's the danger of a disgruntled employee or something else bad happening inside the company, I would assume that the company or even the people in the projects look at that. And uh, if they feel that some projects are so absolutely critical for whatever reason that they should not be laid open, then they should not be laid open. In our inner source initiative, we will exclude safety critical mm -hmm. projects. But then let's talk about regular projects. And still this disgruntled employee, he will steal a large amount of code. Before he could have only stolen a little bit, now he's you know, he can take a lot, everything that's in inner source, mm -hmm. of course. And I mean, I know this is a challenge or a danger that exists. And so far I've been telling our management is like, well, you know, yeah, but see the chances are, the opportunities are so much higher and bigger that, that this should not keep us from doing it. But still the danger is, I think you exist. gave, uh, so as your answer, you just said benefits versus risks. I see that Denise is eager and Nicolas is also Nicolai. companies in the world right now have gotten over this or they never had this concern and and that means that the rest of the industry is forced into a position where they have to adopt that um, stance and take the risk just to stay competitive and you know it's better for engineers so we should be happy about that right Nikolai Test, test, test. Okay, yeah. Actually, the very same question was asked by the Deutsche Börse German Stock Exchange employees to their CIO. What if somebody from our Czech office is just taking the entire source code of the German Stock Exchange? And then the CIO was challenging them. And then what? Will this disgruntled employee just stand up a new stock exchange? Will somebody just found a new Bosch, for instance, with a source code? Because it's not just about the source code, it's about the people. And in the moment you want to build up something big, I mean, you, you still violated all kind of NDAs and employment contracts. So in the moment you want to go out huge with that, you will be sued the heck out of it, and this is okay, right? This is why you, why you sign those NDAs and your employment contracts. But even the worst case, not a single person can just stand up another Bosch. And that was, at least for, at Deutsche Börse, their, their main line of argumentation. Yes, thank you for the comments. Any other questions? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. um, these platform teams currently in most enterprises develop libraries, which then they distribute among um, different projects. Mm -hmm. Does that platform team become the inner source team that starts to govern and regulate inner sourcing and start something like that? So in my opinion, these are two different situations. I explained this because that was a reality eight years ago for companies who are willing to sponsor our research. And you will find that situation that you'll have to deal with an existing platform team, which believes it's their job and what do you want from them? Um, so that's why perhaps uh, across business units where there is no platform team approach might be the easier way to go. Um, if you see that and ask yourself, um, or your manager asks, or big boss asks, how could it be possible that these collaborate? All you need to do is to remind them of how open source works. Um, so say inside the Apache Software Foundation or through the Apache Software Foundation, you have IBM, SAP, Oracle jointly developing software. There's no platform organization. It's individual people from these companies. Uh, jointly developing software collaboratively, more or less harmoniously, um, while at the same time in front of a customer, they fight each other to the knife. Uh, so software developers can 
uh, very well without a platform organization collaborate and open source shows us nicely how it's done. to inner source model, how do you address this? How do you gather the requirements for all the, well, there's no platform team actually? Yep. Um, so there are multiple stages of how do you manage, in quotation marks, an inner source project. The immediate volunteer type of open source answer is people are scratching their own itch, so they are developing the features they need. I think you will quickly, or we've seen how you'll quickly go a step beyond that, just like in open source. There will be people who feel more responsible for that, and they're not just focused on getting their own needs in there, but they will see the need of maintaining the overall integrity of the component. So that's the difference between, between having a classic agile methods feature-oriented view of the world and having an open source component-oriented view of the world where you want to make sure the component itself is of high quality, whatever new features um, come to it. So, and that will also be the people who critically start to de are depending on these components. So I think enlightened managers will see how some of the work of their people is not just immediately my feature, my feature, my feature, but, collabor uh, but contributes to the overall uh, um, consistent, consistent quality of uh, the component. And these people who have a longer term loyalty, if you will, with the component are the ones who will be managing and reviewing a requirements engineering process. If open source is a guide, what will happen eventually is that, say, a business unit says, okay, we critically depend on this component. I want to be in there with a person of mine. Uh, and if they are smart rather than obnoxious, then this person will be welcome and will be led and coached to become a valuable contributor, which, among other things, involves, oh, from our to-do list, uh, from our set of requirements, this is open, would that be of interest? You could help, you could learn the ropes if you start contributing that way. I work at PayPal and I'm in charge of the ALM, the Application Lifecycle Management. So I'm actually now basically running several different major portions of the platform organization at PayPal. And one of the things that we've been working on a lot is actually intersourcing that platform so that there's more and more tools coming in from all of the other different product teams themselves. And one of the things that we found that to be our new focus is creating a lot more standards and organizations than we had existed that it existed previously. So it's been kind of cool because some of y'all saw my checklist book that I did um, a year ago and now I've got so much more information in regards to it because now we're actually looking at what are the UX standards, what are all these other different standards so that all those teams can cl collaborate on the platform more efficiently. So that's kind of the direction where we seem to be going. Thank you for the comment. Other questions in the back? Hello. Hello. I'm Spiros from Nokia. So we, this is exactly the model that we're trying to utilize in Nokia, in inner source. And one of the basic bottlenecks that we have is the contradicting priorities of the inner source assets with the product assets mm -hmm. from development point of view. So each product has um, a backlog, prioritized backlog, and then we have a common requirement uh, board decide for this common asset that needs to be created. And then we have a contradicting priorities between these common assets, inner source assets, and the product assets. Mm -hmm. So this is a big problem for us. Yep. So uh, if I interpret correctly what you're saying, um, then the requirements for an inner source asset are not necessary. So each uh, business unit or product unit uh, comes with its own requirements. You would want to channel them into the overall requirements backlog, uh, product backlog, say, for the inner source component. And I hear you say that the negotiation process of how to prioritize that doesn't work very well, or it's even, they cannot even be merged or contradictory, the requirements that are coming to it. There are coming uh, requirements within the product. Mm -hmm which are suddenly highly prioritized, and then we are losing the control of the existing priority of the inner source components that 
So there's a staged process of how people are involved. So if you're uh, from the uh, product unit and your manager interferes with the inner source component process of these are our requirements, let's work on that, then you get a conflict yeah? because your manager from the product unit is overriding the priorities as you previously negotiated them about all contributors. Um, I think you can only do this so often because ultimately you're obviously not a good citizen. Uh, because now that consensus you had with the other product units for joint collaborative development here is going out the window as you prioritize and withdraw, prioritize differently and withdraw ultimately your commitment of resources to the component. So I think that's not what you want. Uh, so inner source is understandably uh, not working. Um, how to go about it? Uh, I would obviously try to... Uh, uh, talk sense, if you will, into the managers to see the benefits of the continued collaboration and have this staged approach of here are your people working exclusively on features you specifically need all the way to here's your investment in the component you critically depend on, which is uh, a shared contribution with others on a level that's not immediately satisfying your top feature priorities, but is there for the upkeep of a component uh, that you all need. So what we did at PayPal was we quantified the cost of those escalations, and then it was pretty easy to get management to give us air cover to temporarily suspend escalation, as in managers can't re reprioritize. That, you know, we're gonna try it for a little while with that not being the way that you get your work done as a manager. And, you know, it was super easy to say, wow, look, they got 60% of their productivity back because you stopped interrupting them, <laughs> right? So there's another way to do it, which is just get management on your side. And then, and then you can squeeze play the managers, I mean senior management, and you can squeeze play the middle managers. Middle managers are always the problem, as Dirk said before. I'm actually in favor of sending them all somewhere on vacation. <laughs> Another question or comment? Thanks. Um, one of the things that's been really useful is um, we've been made all of our um, development within those inner source teams for those tools completely transparent. In fact, we have even started publishing on the wall of, a, of the actual office what we're working on, which directly parallels what we have in Rally, so that everybody can see, and in Confluence, so everybody can see exactly what we've prioritized when and where. And then we basically decide on those priorities based off of management and measurement. And so everybody knows exactly when their stuff's coming in, when we're going to evaluate theirs, things of that nature, and, when, and if they're getting bumped, why they're getting bumped. And the funny thing that ended up being the best thing that we did is we have a weekly online meeting where we discuss it. And all of those teams all log in and show up to those weekly meetings to see when and where and why we've prioritized all those things. I think Nikolai was raising his hand. Well, there, there's one. What I've seen working at Zalando is that if a team wanted a feature really, really badly right now, they just said, why don't you contribute it back directly to the component you want to change? I mean, this implies that it's not contradicting in its requirement, but if they really want an elevator, just open a pull request to the feature. I mean, this is one of the beauties of uh, middle manage, actually of inner source for middle managers. If you want to do something instead of fighting all the big backlog meetings, just, just do it yourself. Your developers are now empowered to also change other applications, other frameworks, and if, you, if, 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 if it's so important for you, then, then let's just do it, right? 